in death. <clears throat> in me, from life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my death. Stunny, no power of hell, no scheme of man can never pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Our invitation song is going to be, I Believe in Jesus. Praise God. Through whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And the church says, Amen. what a blessing to be here with you this morning. Easter Sunday, as we call it. The day we celebrate the resurrection of Christ coming from the tomb. But we live in a world of skeptics, don't we? We always have, I guess. People who want to challenge that. and want to say, well, it didn't happen. It's impossible. How, how could that event occur? over 2,000 years ago, and, and why do we have the faith that we have? Why do we believe in something that obviously is impossible, right? For someone to raise from the dead, for someone never to die again. That's a really good question, isn't it? Do we have a basis for that faith, a basis for our belief? And the answer is absolutely, absolutely we do. But you know, as much as we live in a world of skeptics today, Jesus lived in a world of skeptics, didn't he? He was surrounded by people who didn't believe that he was the Christ, didn't believe he was the Messiah, didn't believe that it was he who had come to save the world. He was surrounded by people who doubted him. He was surrounded by people who argued with him, who challenged him, who cursed him, and ultimately those who hung him upon the cross. Jesus lived in a world that was, he was surrounded by people who, who obviously didn't believe that he was who he said he was. Isn't that quite fascinating, isn't it? A God, a Jesus, a Christ, the Son of God who came to save the Jews and it rejected by the very people that he came to save. Makes us wonder, why? How did this happen? So people for years, for centuries, have tried to explain it away. Tried to explain it away. Something else had to have happened. It couldn't be what we say that it is. So they've tried and tried to do that, and the Bible, of course, has refuted that. People say, well, he wasn't really dead, right? He really didn't die on that cross. They hung him up there. They, they put a crown of thorns on him. They beat him. They flogged him. They made him walk up the Calvary Mountain. They made him walk up to the place and to where he was ultimately crucified. They drove nails through his hands, nails through his feet, but somehow he survived. And yet the Bible says, oh, that just simply didn't occur. You know, the Romans were really good at killing people. They had a knack. They were good at it. So when the Romans put somebody on a cross, they weren't going to bring them down until, until they were dead, until they knew that there was no life left in them, no breath left in them. And yet the Scripture said through prophecy that not a bone of Christ would be broken. Not a bone would be broken. And so since it was a high Sabbath and since they wanted them down before the Sabbath, they, they asked Pilate to, uh, to break their legs. You see, to, to die on a cross was to asphyxiate. And the only way you could, and I, I hear this, I read this, I've never been on a cross, but I've, I've heard this is how it works. The only way you could stay alive on the cross was to lift yourself with your feet to breathe. Because as you hung there suspended, you couldn't get your breath. So you had to raise yourself up to breathe and let yourself back down. Of course, that would be a tiring process. But in order to hasten the death, what they would do is they would break the legs of the people on the cross, and they would be unable to lift themselves. And because of that, ultimately, they would succumb. They would asphyxiate, and they would die. And because they wanted these people off the cross, they told Pilate, they said, they said, have their legs broken so they'll die quicker because Sabbath begins at sundown. So by sundown, we need them off the cross. By sundown, 
We don't need them hanging there. Because the Old Testament says, cursed is anyone who hangs upon a tree and they shouldn't hang overnight. It's an Old Testament idea. So they didn't want them to be on that tree or on that cross overnight. So they said, break the legs, yet they come to Jesus. And they found that he was already dead. And they pierced his side with a spear and blood and water ran out. You know, Jesus was dead when he came off of that cross. There was no life left in him. Jesus said his last words, right? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know, the idea that Jesus died on that cross, died away from the God he loved with the sins of mankind placed upon him. Even the soldiers at the cross, as the earth quaked and the sky grew dark, they said, surely this man is the son of God. Surely we've done a terrible thing. But the truth is, is that when Jesus was dead upon that cross and before sundown we needed to get him off that cross didn't we put him in a tomb and it was a rich man a man who was a who was a follower of Jesus but was a secret follower of Jesus because of fear of the Jews a man named Joseph of Arimathea Joseph of Arimathea came to Pilate and requested the body of Jesus and he brought another really interesting character of the Bible with him didn't he Nicodemus Nicodemus, who in John chapter 3, he came to Jesus by night, and Jesus said, unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless you're born of water and spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And this Nicodemus came with Joseph of Arimathea to take the body of Jesus down from the cross. Isaiah 53 says that Jesus would be, would be numbered with the transgressors, and he was, hung between two thieves upon the hill of Calvary. But Isaiah 53 also says that Jesus would be laid with the rich in his death. And Joseph of Arimathea was a rich man. Took money to have tombs in those days. It was rocky. Judea is a rocky place. It was a rocky hillside, and they carved the tombs out of the stone. That took a lot of expense to do that, and because of that, they used them over and over. They would just continually put more people in. They would push grandma back and slide grandchild in, or however you want to look at that. They would continually reuse these tombs. Yet Joseph of Arimathea had a tomb that was hollowed from the rock that no one had ever been laid in. It attested to his wealth, his wealth as a Jew. It attested to his position as a Jew. And that he was able to go to Pilate and request that body and say, I'm going to lay him in my own tomb, a tomb where yet no one has ever been laid. But there's more interesting things in this passage. It says Nicodemus came and he brought myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds by weight. Now, in our weight, it would be about 75 pounds. You know, I thought about that as I prepared this sermon. I thought, you know, I've, I've carried a lot of weight in my life, and, you know, 75 pounds is a pretty good load, ain't it? And here old Nicodemus, maybe he had a little help, right? And here Nicodemus came with 75 pounds of spices. That's a tremendous amount of money, unbelievable amount of money. You know, when, the, when Jesus' feet was anointed, remember that? And it said that could be sold and given to the poor. And Jesus said, the poor you have always with me, but you, you don't. Remember that? And he was criticized for wasting that little bit of ointment that was used, that pound of nard that was used to anoint his feet. Could have been fed the poor. And then here was 75 pounds of spices that Nicodemus brought to Jesus. And they took Jesus down from the cross. And, and I think it's, it's worth noting that they took the body of Jesus. They bound it in linen wrappings with the spices as a burial custom of the Jews. So I I thought in my mind, and maybe something I really hadn't thought about a lot, but I thought, here's this Jesus that's, that's dead and in the tomb, you know, and maybe even somehow he was alive, and they wrap him all up with 75 pounds of spices. And I'm thinking, that's, that's pretty impressive, right? They wrap him all up and wrap his head up and put this around his head with all these spices. And then the Bible says that they took and they, and they put a stone over this over this place where Jesus was, this tomb, laid with the rich in his death. So I was watching a thing one time, and they were talking about this, and they said, well, it's real simple what happened here. You see, what happened is that they forgot the tomb Jesus was in. You know, have you ever been to a cemetery? I go to the cemetery the other day. My, most of my family's buried up in Chelsea, Oklahoma, if you know where Chelsea is. And there's a little cemetery up there in Chelsea. And every time I go up there, I try to find the graves of my grandfather and other people in my family. And every time I get lost, 
And I wandered around the cemetery looking at tombstones like, where's granddad? Where'd we leave granddad? You know, I've lost granddad out here in the tomb somewhere. You know, it takes me a while to find it. So it can be kind of confusing. But the truth is, is this tomb was new. It was Joseph of Arimathea. the rich man's tomb. It was a prominent tomb. And on top of that, it's a tomb where, where when they went there, the women who, were, who would follow Jesus, these women who were there, uh, the Marys and the other women who had went with Jesus and saw him at the cross, these women followed him to that tomb, and they watched as Jesus was, the body was prepared. He was placed within that tomb, and the stone was rolled over. They knew exactly where it was. They knew exactly where to look. They knew exactly where to go. In the Scripture, when they went to the tomb early that morning, the Bible's very clear. They knew exactly which tomb to go to and which tomb the stone had been rolled away from. The woman who had come with him out of Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. You know, it's something I didn't think much about, but they watched how it was done. They watched how they wrapped his face and wrapped his body and put the spices around it. I'm not exactly sure how you do that, but they watched as he was prepared and his body was laid into that tomb and that, and that he was indeed dead and he was indeed in that tomb and they sealed that tomb. And then, of course, the Sabbath, which would have happened at sundown, they rested they rested during that next day, during that Sabbath day before the tomb would be open. So they say, well, you know, if that didn't happen, then they must have stole the body, right? I mean, that makes sense. So they put him in there. They wrap him all up. They're going to put that stone over there, and then it's the Sabbath, and, and somebody's going to come. They're going to steal the body of Jesus away. They're going to hide it somewhere, and then they're just never going to tell anybody for the rest of eternity that they did that. We're going to get back to this in a minute. So that's what they did. But you know, the Jews knew that, didn't they? Because Jesus had said, you put this body in three days, I'll raise it. The Jews knew that. It seems like they knew it better than his own disciples knew it. And they said, well, if we're going to do that, let's make that, let's make that tomb secure. Because guess what? If that body's not there, we've got a problem. If that body's not in there, after three days, we've got a problem. So let's make sure that body is exactly where it's supposed to be. So they went to Pilate, and they said, remember when he was still alive? He said, after three days, I'll rise again. And you give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal it away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead. The last deception will be worse than the first. And Pilate said to them, you have a guard. Go make it as secure as you know how. And they went to the grave secure and along. They set a seal on the stone. So they took wax, they took a wax deal, and they put wax on it, and they sealed it. And generally when they did that, they would put a Roman insignia on that seal, not to break it. So we gave them this guard, and they said, go and secure that tomb, make sure nobody steals that body away. Because the Jews says, boy, if that body's not in there, if it's not in there where we said it was going to be, boy, we're in trouble, aren't we? We're in a lot of trouble. So let's make it as secure as we can. Let's put that guard there. And you know, we know from the from the New Testament, that if a Roman guard failed, they were put to death. Of course, in this case, they're going to pay him off. Tell him to say, well, the body was stolen. But you know, the truth is, is the body wasn't stolen. The body was never there. It was gone. So what about this body? You know, what's interesting, isn't it? When Jesus raised, was raised from the dead, the very first person that saw him was Mary Magdalene. And Mary came to the garden, came to the tomb, and she was looking for Jesus, knew exactly where to go. The stone was rolled away. She was confused. Where is he? Where's the guard? Where's the people supposed to be taking care of him? Where's everybody at? But you know, the interesting thing about the passage is, have you ever seen somebody where they're not supposed to be? Let me put that a different way. Have you ever seen somebody that you're used to seeing somewhere in a uniform or behind a counter and you see them someplace else? You know, I'm not real good with names. My wife is, praise the Lord. When I give her that look, the look, she knows I don't know who they are. I don't have a clue. And she helps me out. But the truth is that sometimes we see somebody somewhere and I'll go, and they'll say, hi, Rex, how you doing? And I'm like, well, hi, how are you? I hate to say, I don't have no idea who you are. I say, hi, how are you? It's good to see you. How are you doing? Right? Like we do. And so I say that, and then we walk away from them, and Susie, she knows I don't have a clue who they are because I gave her the look. And she looks at me, and she goes, oh, you know them. They work down there. And I say, oh, yeah. You know? But without being where they're supposed to be in a strange setting, maybe without a uniform or something they have on, I don't know who they are, do I? I don't recognize them. 
You know, here's Jesus at the garden with Mary. And let's just say, for instance, let's say that maybe he didn't die. Maybe somehow he survived all this and, he, and somehow he got out of this tomb and somehow he foiled the guards and somehow he wound up out of there. You know, it looks to me like the Jesus that Mary expected to see would be a bloody, beat up, barely able to move shell of a man. I mean, let's face it. He's been beaten, he's been flogged, he's been crucified, he's been in a tomb for three days. If by some miracle this man walked out of there, by some miracle he walked out of there, he's certainly going to look like a man who's been through what he's been through. But when Mary saw this man, she didn't recognize him, did she? Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where they've laid him. Isn't it amazing? Mary didn't say, well, he said he was going to rise again on the third day. It's interesting. The Jews seemed to know that in his own people who didn't seem to understand. She goes, where have you laid him? I'll go get him. She didn't. She would have known if he was gone, if he'd been taken, yet she knew he should have been there. But it's interesting, fascinating to me that she saw a resurrected Christ. A Christ who had the scars of a crucifixion. He said to Thomas as he appeared behind closed doors, his apostles reach into my hands, reach into my side, feel the scars, but scars that were healed. A Jesus who had been, who had been healed, a Jesus who had been resurrected, and then a resurrected body, and she didn't, she didn't really see him, did she? She didn't, really, she didn't really see him for who he was because it wasn't what she expected. He wasn't what she expected because he was resurrected. You know, one of the most powerful arguments for the resurrection is the people who saw Jesus after he was raised. You know, there's nothing better than a firsthand witness, a firsthand account of something that's occurred. And Mary was the first one there. And he said to her, Mary, and she turned and said to him, Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. She knew exactly who he was. Can you imagine her joy? The Bible says she held to him, she clung to him. He says, stop clinging for me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but I go to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. It's amazing, her joy is she saw Jesus, and Jesus in a resurrected state. But the truth is, it wasn't just Mary that saw Jesus. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, he says he appeared to Peter, he appeared to the twelve, and we know that multiple times behind closed doors of the Sea of Tiberias. He, uh, he appeared to the two men on the road to Emmaus who he visited with, and they said, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked to us on the way? And understand that he appeared to them. It says, but Paul also tells us something that we don't get anywhere else in the Bible. It says he appeared to more than 500 at one time. Now we don't see that in the Gospels, but Paul attests this to be true. And it's interesting in this passage that Paul puts forth a challenge. He says, many, most of whom remain until now. In other words, this was not done in a secret. Isn't that what Paul said when he stood and made his defense? He says, you know this thing wasn't done in a corner, right? The whole world knows. People know. You know what would have been fascinating to live at this time, at the time of Paul, and have been able to go to someone and say, did you see a resurrected Christ? They say, yeah. I saw him. He preached to me. He looked good, right? He looked fit. A couple of scars. Other than that, he looked, looked good, right? I mean, that would be something, wouldn't it? That idea that we not only have eyewitnesses, Paul says, but we have eyewitnesses you can go talk to. You can ask them. You can question them about being with the resurrected Christ, about being with a Jesus who was raised. You see, the world says, oh, it can't happen. It's impossible. You know, I want to tell you, the world says a lot of things aren't possible. Right? You know, it's not possible that we exist. I don't believe in a worldly view. It's not possible that the earth rotates that it does or that gravity is what it is or that the universe is as broad as it is. And it's not possible for something to be infinite. And yes, we understand we live in an infinite universe. Just because man says something is impossible doesn't mean that it's not possible with God. doesn't mean there's not a power at work that's more powerful than we can understand. A God that we serve, a God who we know, and a God who sent his son to die for the sins of those he created. It's a fascinating idea and a fascinating thought, but Paul would say, listen, listen, ask them. They're here. They can tell you. He appeared to James and then to all the apostles. 
And then Paul says, and last of all to me, right, is one untimely born. You know, the idea here is that this was something that happened. This is something people knew. This is something people could observe. This is something people could see. That Jesus not only, they not only saw Jesus, but he talked to them. He said, touch me, feel me, put your hand in my side. He ate with them. He drank with them. He challenged them, right? Touch me, feel me. Does a spirit have flesh and blood? Can a spirit eat and drink? No. This is a resurrected body. You see, the soul of Jesus never ceased to exist. The soul of Jesus never perished. The soul of Jesus was on a mission before the resurrection. But the truth is, is that the body of Christ laid in that tomb dead, and the body of that Christ was raised again. You know, the truth of this whole story, though, that always gets me, is that if Jesus, this really didn't happen, and this really didn't occur, then these men had to perpetuate a lie, didn't they? Throughout the centuries, throughout their whole lifetime, they had to perpetuate something that wasn't true. You know, have you ever tried to keep a lie? I shouldn't ask that question in church, should I? Have you ever tried to keep a lie? Have you ever shared your lie with somebody else by chance? And you said, listen, don't tell anybody, right? And have you done that with like five people or ten people? So just stay with me for a minute. So if you take the ten people you know the best, and you, and you had this great lie, and you went to these 10 people and you said, listen, I've told this terrible lie and none of you can repeat it. How do you think that would work out? I mean, in the long run, right? I mean, you might get away with it for a while, maybe a month or two, day or two, year or two. How about 15 years, 20 years? Now, nah, somebody's going to spill the beans. Isn't that what we call it? You're going to spill the beans, right? So you take these 12 guys who knew Jesus Better than, well, 11, let's say 11 because of Judas, but they replaced him with, with Matthias, right? These 12 guys who knew Jesus better than anybody, and you say they're going to have to get together, and they're going to have to, throughout their whole lives, say this really didn't happen. It was all a lie. This whole thing was a scam. You know, I thought about that a little bit. Why would you keep a lie? Generally because you're going to get something out of it. Am I right? If you lie about something, it's generally because either you're going to get something out of it or it's going to keep you from getting something taken away. It's one of those two things. Because if you're going to lie, you've got to have motivation. Am I right? So the truth, here, the, the, the truth of this is, I thought, what would be the motivation for these guys to lie? I mean, let's face it. They're hiding behind locked doors because they're scared for their lives right they've given up their livelihoods they think this they really think jesus failed them at this particular point in history before the resurrection they're scared for their lives they're scared for everything they've got families they're, the jews are against them the romans are against them everybody's against them there's no monetary value to them saying jesus was alive they're certainly not going to get paid for this there's no glory for this there's no title for this there's no gain in this the easiest thing for these 12 guys to do, if Jesus didn't come out of that tomb, the easiest thing for them to do is to drift back into their life and forget this ever happened and put this three years behind them because, you know, this really didn't occur. But none of them did that, did they? They went through beatings. They went through prison. They went through fear of death. Yet they held their conviction, didn't they? You know, nine riders from 44 to 100 to almost 100 A.D. wrote the books of the New Testament. Jesus was crucified in about 30 A.D. So that means these men would have held that lie for 70 years. They would have died for something that was not true. You know, I'm going to tell you something. People die for faith all the time. You see it every day on the news. Somebody straps a bunch of bombs to themselves, goes in and blows something up, right? Somebody hijacks a plane, sells it into a tower. People die for faith all the time. It's one thing to die for faith. It's another thing to die for a lie. It's another thing to die for something that you know is not true. But yet these 12 men, these 12 apostles, who followed Jesus, who spent the time with him, who saw the resurrection, who saw the crucifixion, who saw the empty tomb, these men who knew him better than anybody else all went to horrible deaths except for John, who died of old age. They all went to horrible deaths for a lie, for something that didn't happen. You know, I even thought if they all died at one time in one place and they kind of lean on each other a little bit, 
Maybe they could have got through that. But these men died all over the world. At different times, at different places, by different means. And they all died for one thing. Because they said Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. They all died for this. And you know, the truth is, it wasn't easy deaths, was it? They were stabbed. They were beaten. They were crucified. Andrew was hung on an X-shaped cross. We call that Andrew's cross. Peter was crucified upside down because he refused to be crucified like his Lord. Paul was beheaded. Peter you know, the truth is, Bartholomew, you'll most think, was skinned alive and then beaten with clubs, thrown from walls, stabbed, beheaded. Terrible deaths for a lie, for something that didn't happen, for something that didn't occur. I don't buy it, do you? I just don't buy it. How can we believe the impossible? Because it's the only thing that makes sense. Nothing else in this story can make sense if Jesus Christ didn't come out of that tomb. He was dead. He was beaten. He was flogged. He was crucified. He was wrapped. He was seasoned. Right? And yet, he lives. People look at the Bible sometimes and they say, well, it's a good story. Right? Once upon a time. Ain't that how fairy tales start? Once upon a time. But the Bible's not a fairy tale. The Bible's reality. It's salvation for you and me. It tells a story, a true story. A story of a man who was a son of God who came and lived a nondescript life for the first 30 years of his life. A man who never traveled more than 90 or 100 miles from the place that he was born. A man who never held a degree. A man who never held a title. A man who, as far as we know, never owned a home. Never had anything that we consider great or precious. Whose only belongings, a robe. was basically auctioned off at the feet of the cross where he was crucified. And yet there's no man on the face of this earth. There's no country, there's no ruler, there's no army that's ever marched that's changed the face of this earth like this one man who died on a cross and who was raised from the dead. And that's why we're here this morning. A man who has changed my life. A man who has changed who I am. And a man who's changed even who I want to be. A man who's given me hope beyond this life. He's given me hope beyond the grave. A story that's so true that I believe it with every fiber of my body. Peter says, We did not follow cleverly devised tales. We made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. You know, I believe what they say. I believe what it says. And I'm glad and I hope that you do too because it's the only way to get to heaven. You know, the truth is, the stone wasn't rolled away so that Jesus could get out, was it? Jesus could have got out. The stone was rolled away so that we could look in and see that he was gone. What a blessing. What a blessing to have you here this morning. What a blessing to share this story, the greatest story ever told. A story that changed the world. Do you believe in an empty tomb? Well, I do. And it changed my life. And if you really believe that tomb was empty, what will you do with Jesus? If we can help you in any way, won't you let it be known while we stand and sing. 
I believe in the one they call Jesus.